you the Buddha right after he became fully enlightened he decided he was going to continue sitting and he sat for seven days thinking about dependent origination and observing dependent origination and how it works every time in every situation He spent a few days looking at it forward. He spent a few days looking at it backwards. In other words, he looked at the cause and effect forward, and then he saw the cessation. And he did this for seven days. Then he got up and stretched a little bit. And he thought, you know, this tree that I've been sitting under has really done me a good thing. So he walked off a few feet from from the tree so he can have a view of the tree and now Bodhi trees you want to you talk about a big tree we're talking big um, when I was in Burma I went to this one place where there was a Bodhi tree and I was maybe a mile and a half away from it and I looked at this tree and I went, wow, that's a big tree. And when I got close to it, it was really, really big. Wonderful tree. So he stepped back from the Bodhi tree and he just gazed at the Bodhi tree in uh, with a mind that was very thankful and respectful. And then he went to different places and sat for a week here and a week there under this tree and that tree. And after seven weeks, then he started thinking about whether he really wanted to go to all the trouble of telling other people about this. Because he 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 knew that it was it was really hard to explain this to other people so that they would listen and actually gain benefit. Now, there was another there was a Brahma. There was somebody in the Brahma realms that read his mind, and he thought, "Oh my, he's considering not doing the teaching," and he immediately. Uh, came down to the human realm and started talking to the Buddha and pleaded with him, basically. And he said, you know, there are people with little dust in their eyes. There are people with a lot of dust in their eyes. But the people with little dust in their eyes, if you just say a few things to them, they will get it. So he, the Buddha, because he had all of these psychic powers by now, he surveyed the world and he saw, yeah, this is true. There are these beings that have a little dust in their eyes. So it won't be too tiring for me to teach them. And then he thought, well, who should I teach first? And he thought, well, my first teacher... Uh, who taught me how to get into the realm of nothingness. He has a little dust in his eye. Maybe I'll go and teach him. And the Brahmin that had come from the Brahma Loka, he said actually he died a week ago. And the Buddha looked with his psychic ability and said, yes, that's true. Now he had died and he had gone into the realm of nothingness, he, where there's no body. So there's no way for the Buddha to be able to teach him. You have to have a body to be able to taught, taught this, this kind of thing. So then the, the Buddha started thinking, well, okay, he's, he's dead and gone. Then maybe I will teach my second teacher, Ramaputta. He has a very little bit of dust in his eyes. Suppose I teach him. And the Brahmin said, actually, he just died last night. And the 
Buddha looked and he said, yeah, that's true. These guys are really missing something great here. So then he started thinking, who else could he teach? And he realized that these these ascetics that had been with him from the start of his being a monk or an ascetic, they were actually pretty wise people and they would understand reasonably fast. So he decided that he would go and teach these five monks. And they were some distance away. Now, when... The Brahmin started looking around and he saw that there was some uh, merchants that were coming through with their goods. And he, w- they, he went to these Brahmins and said, if you guys really want to make some amazing merit, come and offer food to this ascetic. It will be to your benefit for a very, very long period of time. So they did that. But the Buddha didn't know how to accept the food because he didn't have any bowl. Remember, he threw his gold bowl in the in the river. It sank. Not around anymore. And the devas, uh, Saka was one of them. I can't remember the names of the others, but they, they read the Buddha's mind and they said, oh, he doesn't have a bowl. So they took all of their bowls and made it into one. There was four of them. And created a crystal bowl. And they brought it down and it appeared right in front of the Buddha so he could accept the food. And he used that same bowl for the whole time that he was a monk. Or that he was alive. So the Buddha used a crystal bowl to eat out of. Now the story goes that the Buddha wanted to make these merchants very happy. And he told them that he was fully enlightened. And he said, because you've done this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pluck out some of my hairs and give them to you. And you can use these as as, uh, remembering me and making your mind happy and all of that sort of stuff. Now, depending on the country that you visit, if you're in Burma, they say that it was Burmese merchants And when they left the Buddha, they came back to Burma and they took these hairs and they made a pagoda and put them in the pagoda. I have some real troubles with this because I have visited many pagodas in Burma and all of them have his hair relic in them. He would have been more than bald I'll tell you (laughs) but whether this is really true or not I don't know but the story is that he gave three or seven hairs two hairs okay Uh, for these these other uh, merchants so that they could remember him and be happy Uh, There's an interesting thing that happens with uh, a lot of monks that are advanced in meditation. And that is when they shave their head, laymen want their hair because every wholesome thought they have, the monk has, if they have have his hair in a little vial and it's around his neck, then they would get happy too. That's the belief. And I've seen this happen with quite a few advanced meditator monks. Anyway, 
the Buddha went and he taught these five ascetics and his first discourse was on the Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths and Dependent Origination. And that's how all of this got came to be. But it's real interesting that he he was he was really considering very seriously how troublesome it would be to teach other people whose minds are just really out there. They got a lot of dust in their eyes and they would want to argue with him and all of this kind of thing. But he had the knack and purity to draw people to him that were ready to hear what he had to say. And a lot of people became arahats during his lifetime. Okay, so I'm done telling stories. Anybody else have one? (laughs) 